Just a short video showing a night move into a bigger area. We're using 100 meter wide strips, 10 meter long sections, five to six moves a day. That's the movement that the cattle are doing, so they come in from there. Um, the water is just on the left, sorry, in the ring there. It's um, portable water, so they can always go back to it. We back, don't back fence, but they're always up moving uh, where we're wanting to go. Um, I can guarantee that if you manage like this, it'll work. Uh, this is an automatic gate lifter to reduce the number of trips out to shift them. Um, so it was programmed for seven o'clock to go off and they all start drifting through. I really like the way the calves run up from in the background and even all the stragglers and that everyone moves together. Um, I'd like you to note the colour of where we've been and where we're going to because it's really important that if we're going to do this sort of grazing we've got to mimic nature. I think we've forgotten what nature looks like so I've just clipped in a little section of the Great Plains video here showing the stock density uh, that they manage at and also that colour change from, uh, from the left to the right. Um, yeah, so this is the sort of management. We know that during the drought, this is drought proof. It's very low risk. It's always profitable, low cost of production, uh, really good uh, sleepability, as uh, a friend of mine would say, because um, you know the animals are going to be well, effectively no animal health issues. Uh, it does take some skills and management, and we're thinking about uh, running some courses on uh, Naringla to do that. So if you wanted to do... Uh, have a look at those courses uh, just give us a call or a phone or have a look at the website thanks for watching bye what I've been saying to people and I thought it would really put people off I go if you want to learn how to do this I'm your man if you want to learn how to do grazing the top third doing any of that other stuff go and get someone else and, I th and people go, oh, no, we'd like to do that. On a day, we try and aim for always over a 1,000 cows a hectare, but that's into the night paddock, so it's a bigger strip, and that takes a fair bit of experience to work out. It's about 40% of their daily demand we give them overnight. It's got a little solar panel and a timer, and it's a cam, and it just goes, boop. What they do in the dairy industry, and you need to just Google Batlatch sort of thing, is that they use it that in that horizontal plane and they just have a spring with a gate and the dairy cows. We've found with big mobs, so we've had up to sort of 500 cattle in that mob. So, and then, and as I said earlier, we spend 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes at night. They started the day in a little strip here and then they had another little strip, another little strip, another little strip. So this is a lane up here and this is a lane down there. So yeah, 100 metres wide, 10 metre long and five to six a day, maybe more. So what we do is we don't reduce the stock density, we increase the number of moves. So if it's skinny and not much grass, we do more moves, we don't back off. So we always keep that high stock density and we do a combination of gut fill and contentment until, and dung scores until we get them going. So what I teach people is to use the gun, dung score. If they're moving once a day or less frequently, then use the gut fill to shift them and the, and the dung scores. So that gives you instant feedback of have they had enough to eat and is there a good mix? So the dung tells you a good mix between the grass and where their bugs are. Yeah, because what happens is there's a threshold, so I'm not being rude now, there's a threshold above which you don't get rapid germination establishment of the perennial grasses that are in the soil. And you need to find that threshold. So you know how those safe to fail trials, somewhere, once you've got an idea about recovery, you'll start mucking around then with stock density, because it's about it appears to be in a lot of environments over a thousand cows or 10,000 DSE a hectare. Do you know, and it's incredibly, and, and that's why I go, it's incredibly hard, but you've got to get this set up to make it convenient. And if you don't get this set up, to, so what I've been doing, I've been starting my grazing talks with, if you're not prepared to change your fencing, if you're not prepared to change your water, if you're not prepared to change your monitoring, if you're not prepared to change your animals, then don't start, it'll break your heart.
And I go, I hope I'm not overselling this. <laughs> but I have been to so many people that are trying to manage the same merinos or the same cattle or the same thing and doing all that. I go, it will just break your heart. So that's why I'm trying to be very systematic about do your safe to fail trials, learn all this before you start doing this. Because this is about the fourth iteration of fencing on Peter's place. And I go, you just don't want to go through that. It's just a pain. Some of these hills you walk sideways down. You, don't, you can't walk like that. You have to do this step thing. So it is very steep. So we know that these fences now are not facing the right orientation. We should have run them straight up the hills, and walk the contour when you're running the tapes. So all we do is graze them up one of these strips, tuck under, graze them back, so we're doing that up and down sort of thing. The key for this is that all of the lanes nearly feed back to the road, which comes back to the yards. Because it's actually being able to get them in and sell them quickly and easily is how you avoid that running out of grass. Grazing fails when you run out of grass. So you can't run out of grass. Grazing fails from moving too fast. So you can't move too fast. But if you're doing all those things, you then need high stock density and utilisation. So what we did at Peter's is, and I'll just try and explain, you know when I say it's drought proof, it's a pretty big call, isn't it? There's another one. So I have got videos, is that any better? That's, it was halfway down, the hammer's dropping. So the hammer's there and it's dropping. And as it's dropping on that loop, it's dragging that one up. And it's just, an, it's just a cam on a timer and it's got a little solar panel. You set the timer, where you go. And it's got a double beep on it. If you don't set it right, it only single beeps. So now we go, you're standing there waiting for it to double beep. Because if you get it wrong, it can be pretty, uh, pretty difficult. This is what happened during the drought. So how did this happen? This is um, Naringla pre-holistic management training. So this graph shows your ground cover relative to your neighbours or to a selected spot. Below 50, you've got less ground cover than your neighbours. So this was uh, Peter and uh, Jamie Reynolds. So then they did that late 90s. They did training in holistic management. Um, and then this was the consequence of that training. Now, anyone that's done holistic management training will recognise what was happening here. They'd either have a heap of animals, and uh, a heap of grass, and then they'd get animals, and then they'd run out, and it was out of control. It's like a proxy, this ground cover, for your profit. If it's not stable, you can't keep money in the business. They, they mastered the art of buying high and selling low. That's not a good thing. But that's what they did. And it got worse. And then Dad left, and only Peter and I have been managing since here. And for a fair bit of that time, I've been living there as well and stuff. And we know now what to do, but we've got the safe to fail areas. We've got the experience. The recovery is longer than what we need. This is not about grass. This is about having time to react to sell and never running out of grass. It's about not failing. So what Peter does, he likes 14 months recovery. Gabe Brown uses 12 to 15 months. If he starts to go, run into a drought, he, he waits until he gets down to sort of 10 to 12 months recovery. And then he sells animals to get back up to 14 months. So he stays in this band that is beyond damage to the land. Can you see how that works? So on a daily basis, we know what the recovery is because we measure the area. We actually give them enough moves so that they're full and happy and fed and will perform because we get paid on animal performance. Then we go back inside and say, how much did they eat today? Because if we're on, I can't do, if they're on 12 months, they would have eaten one 365th of the grazable area. 
And you can do that easy with Google Earth and multiple ways. Some people, like I had, I, I go, I've given up trying to work out how people work because I go, there was a young kid, you know, he was a phone carrying dude. Do you know? And I said, what are you going to do? Are you going to use Google Earth or a phone app or whatever? And he goes, I'm going to pace it out. I'm going, <laughs> Because I like to guess what the answer's going to be. I go, oh, that's not right. And then he said, we don't have service and I've always got my legs with me. <laughs> Do you know? And I go, you know, you, so you've got to work out how to make this work. What will work for you, not what, I, what we do with Google Earth and things like that. So what will work? Some people space their posts so they just count the posts. But you've got to know how many. And you have to have a plan so that you know whether you're going, whether you're overstocked or not. I don't say understocked anymore. Never ever worry about being understocked. Failure is from being overstocked. You know, so keep breeding up until you go, oh, I'm overstocked and, you know, or the seasons change. So everyone's getting too much stuff to think about is what I believe. We focus on this. Are we overstocked? Are we got the right recovery? Are we getting the animal performance? What's going on? So the fencing and stuff I'm saying is quite sensible and, you, and we argue it's a lot of fence and you know, that's why I do that. I did teach whole farm planning. But the daily operation is what we focus on. And if we do that, we actually, and it actually kicked up, I haven't got the, the latest one, but then the rainfall kicked as well. So as the rainfall dropped, we kept increasing ground cover. So when they say you can't keep carbon, you can with this. And I can teach people this, but only if they want to do this. If you want to do whiz bang, flash harry, you know, higher stocking rates, all that sort of stuff, I'm not your man. If you think this sounds all right, then I'd sign up for the, the ramp program and do the mentoring thing. Because I found that's the best lowest cost way of teaching people this stuff. It kills me, but it's the weekly grind all this out, every question, doing all the, you know, the recoveries, working out sort of all these things about how do you, because we have, you know how many days you're in each of these areas and then we have multiple little paddocks in here. So, but we know we need 40 days or 54 and we know what we're doing. And then, then I get people to put that on a, on a farm map rather than a grazing chart now. Because people will maintain a farm map with some numbers on it. I'm buggered if I can get people to maintain a grazing chart over time. Others are using electronic stuff and that might be good if you're running multiple mobs and don't want to do the right thing and only have one. Did I say that? <laughs> You've got to have one mob and that's really hard for people. It just stresses the hell out of them. But as soon as you go to two mobs, the complexity goes exponential. Because what I'm trying to do is squash this a little bit for people so they go, I've got it. And once they've got it, they, once they can drive in the paddock, then they can go to the race, race car strip or whatever. But if you don't learn to drive one mob properly with lots of feedback and information and see the paddock, see the patterns, you'll never ever get it. It takes the really good people that are really able to handle a lot of ambiguity and things like that, it's taking them 10 to 15 years. So you, Michael and Anna Coughlin, you, you Mos, Andrew and Megan Mosley out at Cobar, it took them that long because they weren't being taught to safe to fail practice areas, high quality, really early high quality feedback so that they can see what happens. And so many of them end up with one mob moving slowly around the landscape. Can you see that? Because then you've got time to react. You keep money, you don't have the losses. Before we go out, you need to know that how to do this gut fill score monitoring. You need to find what's the trigger percentage for you that you will always get animal performance. We found 
it was 20% of the cows a gut fill three. So just starting to show a little bit hollow, but not a lot. You can just pick up the spare ribs and you can pick up the hip and you can pick up the ribs. It was just showing. So it's this region here on the left hand side, not the right hand side, they're not symmetrical. So that left hand side and it's a window to the room and is it full? Have we had enough to eat? This is flat and this one's bulging. You usually have them like that in spring. So what do they look like when the grasses are hardened up and they're going well? This one here, this girl's, this cow here, happy we called her the house cow, because she never was. And then, um, and this was some starving little heifers and that finished, you know, they were down on the, um, the Wallastale Swamp, the dairy down on the Wallastale Swamp, so little Jersey heifers and stuff. And it, and it got too wet and I go, there's a clue in the name here. <laughs> yeah, so, and then they, they were really funny because they got there and they were so little princessy and stuff. Ours just went whomp and ate the next strip. And then they're going, it's all gone by the time they got round organised. Well, they got organised very quickly after that. And they were very aggressive eaters after that. They weren't frightened of me, so I'd have to be hitting them with the reel to keep them. And then the woman came, so six weeks later, she came and said, they got fat, they're going to get fatty udders. I said, oh, it's probably best if you take them back. Do you know, so I'm going, <laughs> they were starving to death. And as we, w we walked out and I said, they'll be running with my cows in this. And she goes, oh yeah, that's okay. She goes, I'm really looking forward to them getting here because gee, they got some disease. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you're yeah, like, I go, oh, well, you talk a big story. Let's see what happens. And it was fine, yeah. Because they were dying of black leg and they were basically, animals don't die from starvation. They die from the diseases caused by the state. They, a consequence. So you've got to remember this is very dynamic, the bob population of the bugs in the gut. So what you give them determines what that is. So if you're giving them green feed and then they go on to dry litter, it changes the bugs and they can't, pro they can't change the population very quickly. So if you never ever chase green pick because they'll change quickly to the green pick, but then if you've got to put them back onto the dry, it takes the, it's real tough. And we go to multiple, multiple moves, might go to 10 moves a day, but to drive them back onto the dry feed. If they got out and got onto green feed or onto the creek flat or something, we'd do that. So yeah, so this falls quickly. So it get, lets people catch that something's going on. You're trying to run this in this band that you don't get failures, you don't get animal health, you don't run out of grass, because that's where the profit is. And that's the problem we've got. So this is dung scores. This is a nice pie with a dip in the middle. So that's what the target is. This is grass too young. This is grass getting too old, but you're looking for the average because it's a bit of a distribution and you want on average to be here. This is less animal performance. This is poor animal health. This is just right, sorry, in the middle there. Yeah, sheep, it's the same thing, but you can't do gut fill as well. And I get people to practice when they're off shears. What do they look like? How do they behave? And I go to people's place. So I mainly always worked with sheep people. And what I'd go there and they'd go, do you think they're getting enough to eat? They look like the walking dead. <laughs> do you know though, like that sort of like they just, and I go, no, they should be bouncing and alive. And, but I'd get them to practice and then they could, they got their eye in that they could pick that slop you know, slops on that left hand side, if they're getting enough water, this all relies on excellent water with lots of drinking, uh, you know, that they don't smell it and walk away, that they drink 70 glugs without a break. That's how they should drink. So this will be in the notes and we're not going to have time to do it all, but there is a lot to doing this and making it work. And it's the same, I think it's the, a soft palate not a, these aren't the right photos because that's still a pretty soft palette, but the photos got mixed up. So, you, you know, that little shop palette with the sheep, it's too dry. It's somewhere here is about right for sheep. And that one's below there. That cow there is about score two. So you get your eye in that you can look at dirty rumps and know what the consequence is. And it's, if I go onto a farm and the and the cows or the ewes have got dirty rumps and low dung scores, 
I immediately look at the lambs and the calves and say, have they got scours? If they've got any, even one in a mob's got scours, I go, we need to take action today. Now it's chaos coming. You can feel it coming because you'll start to then get your scours. That then increases, then you get the immunity down, then the, the whole shooting match down there, that whole disaster of agriculture. And that's just rainfall versus ground cover, but I'm not very happy with that. Neither a farm map 4D. I manipulated the data. I massaged it a little bit too much. I was trying to get an average ground cover versus a rainfall. And they said that I've sort of averaged averages and, you know, all that stuff. But that's about what we've seen. As the rains changed, the ground covers continue to go up. Mm -hmm.